um, hello dear colleagues um, today we have a special guest uh, from national professor from national university of london dr juan bayern and uh, his talk will be dedicated to uh, self complementary antennas with uh, constant input impedance i think uh, the topic will be connected with the uh, extension of Babinet principle uh, to, for the uh, plasmonic surfaces. Am I right? Oh, that's uh, so, uh, let us begin. Please. Thank you, Maxi. Do you think we can minimize the, this week? Thank you, Maxi, for your introduction. So, uh, well, Let's start. Uh, I would like to, to start with this uh, painting by Maurice uh, Escher. Probably you know, you've seen sometimes these kind of paintings with self complementary geometries. Actually, he was uh, making different types of uh, geometrical studies uh, uh, about uh, impossible worlds uh, like this. And it is, in some sense, connected with the topic of the talk of today about self complementary in uh, As Maxine already introduced me, I will uh, start with the, I will continue with the, uh, maybe with some problem with pointer. Is it working now? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, okay. This is the outline of the talk, main goal, some introduction. Uh, in the introduction, I will tell you about Muschiati's ideas on self complementary antennas, some potential applications in optics, and the Babinot principle in optics. Uh, later, uh, I will say something about the theory of the extension of Babinot's principle in plasmonics. Uh, I will show you my last results uh, on self complementary antenna. And finally, I will proceed with the introduction. Well, sorry, with the conclusions. So, this is the main goal of the talk. I want to design broadband optical antennas. They will be based on some self complementary structures, and they should be made of plasmonic and hydroelectric constant materials. Well, let's start with the introduction about Mushiaki's ideas. Actually, uh, he wrote a book. This book was published in 1996, but uh, Muschiake's uh, first proposals were published in 1948. Uh, I have taken this figure from this book about the excitation of mutually complementary structures. You see, it, it, we could call this the original structure. This is the complementary counterpart of this one. If the great or shallow region could be considered perfect electric conductor, and the other one is a hole in the perfect electric conductor chip. Uh, there are two possibilities for the source at the center of this antenna. If you see the original structure, there is a, a, a coupling source, a foil coupling source located at the center. Uh, in the complementary problem, it should be uh, replaced with a magnetic coupling source, but uh, it is also possible to use electric coupling source, uh, but rotated by 90 degrees. Uh, there are two possible options. Magnetic coupling along the same direction of the original electric coupling, or the electric coupling source, uh, sorry, the uh, point coupling source uh, along the horizontal direction. There is a rotation of 90 degrees for the for the carbon source. Well, uh, Muchiakis realized that the product of the input impedance of these two antennas should be uh, uh, connected with this number. So this is called the uh, Muchiakis relationship. Sometimes, other times, it is called duality relation. Uh, and it also appears in complementary uh, filters. Maybe you, you know about that. Uh, let, me, let me just uh, uh, give the formulas here. Uh, E2 is representing the electric field of the second problem. 
H1 is representing the magnetic field of the original problem. So it is saying that uh, we can interchange electric field with magnetic field when we go from the original problem to the complementary one. Something similar with the magnetic field. Probably you know the duality principle in electromagnetics. It is mainly that duality principle. And then the input impedance of the antenna could be that calculated like the line inter path integral, path integral of the electric field along this line divided by the path integral or the line integral along the path CD. So you have current crossing this line and you have voltage along this direction. And the, the pressure between them is normally defined as the impedance. In the complementary problem, you will do the same. And if you replace this electric and magnetic field in those formulas and you multiply them, you will get impedance of the free space over 2 squared. Okay? These are some examples of complementary structures. For instance, you could have a typical dipole antenna, and this could be the, 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 the complementary antenna made like a, a kind of slot. Uh, you, you can see here the point uh, um, current source at the center. It is rotated by 90 degrees with respect to this one. And there are other possibilities. There are only examples. Oh. Uh, the type of, oh, I'm sorry, maybe I have questions uh, during the call. Yes. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, is this Mushakia generation valid for both types of excitation of complementary antenna or only for particular one? Mm. Because mm, you may, in principle, realize this middle one by some small loop around yes. this conductor, uh, and the other one is just uh, a typical point source. Uh, but yeah, they uh, have always the same impedance. Yes, this, have, uh, this is specifically for, for these two uh, excitations. It works for both. For both. Yes. But of course, neglecting some, uh, some reactants that you may introduce by this additional, additional uh, feeder. Yeah? So yes. it doesn't take into account additional reactants. Actually, the source is considered like point source. Very ideal. Mm -hmm. Without any additional reactants inside. Yes, uh, and there are this. Well, there, there could be many examples. They are only examples. And uh, uh, actually, uh, I'm going to introduce now some examples of self-complementary geometry. The first ones were uh, a couple of the structures. One of them could be the original one, the other one, the complementary of the original one. In this case, both examples are self-complementary. If you interchange the perfect electric conductor with a free space, you will get the same geometry except for a 90 degree rotation in this case. In that sense, this is self-complementary. After the interchange of the two materials, free space and metal, <laughs> it will become the same, but for 90 degrees. This is a second example of the same idea. They are two examples of self-complementary geometries. Now, uh, it is the same relation of the previous slide, but due to the self-complementariness, uh, theta 1 and theta 2, the input impedance should be equal. So if you replace the, the same impedance inside, you will get the, the theta is equal theta naught over 2, 188 ohms approximately. And it will happen at any frequency. So the idea is that uh, this is a very broad band antenna because the input impedance is just constant. It is just a number. Okay, uh, some examples of uh, some realizations maybe of the self-complementary antenna could be the spiral one. Uh, could be also this square self-complementary antenna or this antenna that uh, reminds me the log uh, periodic antenna, like uh, very similar also to a Christmas tree, I think. And in all those cases, you can see the, the point source at the center here, 
No, so there is a almost contact point somewhere where we put a, a point source, point current source, right at this contact point. Well, let me tell you some potential applications in optics. Uh, some people is trying to make bolometers. You know that bolometer is a device that is able to measure the intensity of the electromagnetic field indirectly by measuring the temperature, uh, some temperature somewhere. In, in this case, if you illuminate, if you put some incident electromagnetic field over these nano antennas, uh, there could be some currents, very strong currents somewhere, and then the material is hidden. Maybe the material, uh, the structure is made not only from one metal, but two different metals. And then you can use the Seebeck effect. The Seebeck effect implies, uh, well, probably you know the thermocouple. It is the same phenomenon. Uh, the Seebeck effect uh, is used in thermocouple to, to give you a voltage when you have some temperature gradient. So, uh, it could be used as a volumeter in the sense that when you uh, uh, illuminate the nano antenna with some electromagnetic field, there will be some currents uh, induced on the structure. Uh, the structure will uh, heat. Actually, this is also a bow tie antenna. You see how the currents at the center are very, very high. Then uh, there could be some. Uh, increment of the temperature and it could be measured. If uh, the, the two metal uh, for each half of the uh, resonating antenna uh, is made of different metals. Okay, uh, well, th there are several examples of this in the literature, recent literature, like this paper by Fowler. Uh, they were trying to. They, they were claiming it could be used also for for harvesting of energy, conversion of solar energy by broadband and spiral antenna. Uh, actually, they were uh, they, they were doing something similar to what uh, I'm going to show you later. Uh, this material, in, in this case, the material is silver. Uh, and you can see the geometry here. Very tiny. Uh, geometrical parameters like uh, about 50 nanometers, uh, and then there, there is a uh, there is no uh, source in principle uh, in this field. But uh, if uh, you could put some point source at the center, or maybe you can illuminate the structure and, and make some uh, frequency. Uh, you have to rectify the signal at the center and then it could be used in reception to collect or to harvest the energy. Uh, let me show you the figure. Uh, it was very interesting for me because uh, you see here that the input impedance is showing some resistance, which is not negligible, uh, from 300 nanometers in the wavelength to 3000 nanometers. Uh, this resistance is not negligible. The reactance is uh, not very far from 188, but, uh, but there is important deviations. You see the, the level of 200 is more or less like this. Uh, with the Mushiakis idea, it should be 188 ohms. Why this is so far from 188? It, it is more. Uh, well, even more, even more. Uh, it should be reactive only, but, uh, but you see there is also some resistance. So this is far from, from the expected value. Well, uh, there are other, paper, uh, other papers uh, claiming uh, about this uh, potential application of harvesting, like this one by Shekini in 2020. Uh, they were Studying and comparing different geometries, spiral, dipoles, quad spiral, uh, and so on. And there is something interesting here. For the case of the spiral and antenna, which is shown uh, here, you see the, all the geometries they are, they are shaking. Some of them are self complementary, like this spiral, but the other ones are not self complementary, like this. Uh, 
Uh, in the case of the spiral, they have, uh, a, you see in this figure, the electrical field enhancement. Uh, they are looking for a very high electrical field uh, enhancement. In the case of the dipole, maybe the, you get the, the highest enhancement, but only for a narrow uh, uh, bandwidth. In the case of the spiral, it is not so high, but the bandwidth is bigger. Maybe this is connected with the idea that the input impedance may be uh, more stable. Not exactly 188 uh, ohms, but more stable. Uh, well, this is another example about uh, the spiral antenna for uh, solar energy harvesting again. And uh, they were, uh, I like this figure because uh, in this case you can see the thermocouple used by the authors in simulation only uh, to, to measure the temperature at the center of the spiral. And they were also getting the radiation efficiency. Actually, uh, they, they were, in this study, they are, they are using the antenna like an emitting antenna, also like a, a receiving antenna. Uh, this radiation efficiency corresponds with the emitting antenna. They put some uh, point source at the center and then they got the radiation efficiency. But they, actually they want to, to move to the application of the volumeter. So it should be used like, uh, it should be thought like a receiving antenna. And finally, uh, very connected with this uh, application, uh, I found this uh, recent work uh, by Sakmani and others uh, in the SPIE conference the last year. Uh, and then they were showing nice results with the geometry. You see the, 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 the size is about 5 micron for this geometry. Uh, this spiral uh, nano antenna is made of palladium and nickel two different metals, then uh, CBEX effects uh, can uh, provide uh, CBEX effects means that uh, when the, the antenna is receiving an electromagnetic wave and then it is being heated, then there will be some voltage that can be measured from outside the, the antenna. Uh, actually, it's quite difficult to measure some voltage for, the, for this antenna. Uh, Actually, there are many of them connected in series to, to get some measurable voltage. It's very nice structure uh, and results. Um, yes. well, I have a question because it, it reminded me some some other works. There are also portland uh, uh, which the antennas used for terahertz uh, volumeters, but the, uh, Probably in contrast to optical ones, they are made of usual metal. But on the other hand, they are used usually at cryogenic uh, temperatures. For instance, to be sensitive to a very, very small single photon signals coming from, let's say, cosmic microwave background, which is very, very well used in, uh, in radio astronomy. And uh, when the metal is cooled down to cryogenic temperatures, uh, especially uh, down to Kelvin, Single temperatures, they become superconductive. And uh, when this uh, spiral becomes superconductive, you can see some anomalous uh, surface inductance. It needs somehow to be taken into account uh, when you calculate the properties of the antenna. I remember that this effect was not very well studied, and maybe it has some relation to this um, violation of uh, Leibniz principle in plasmonic structures. So maybe. Uh, also, I can, can, can send some works and you can see if it is the same or not. There is also that application. It has to be added to your, to your review. Yes. And even there are some guys in Russia who study this. Yeah. Like hygienic volumeters and connect them to such antennas. Microns. Hmm? In microns. In uh, terapels. Okay. Not infrared, but terapels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, 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 but this issue of deviation is caused not, not by the fact that uh, it becomes lossy or plasmonic, I mean, the metal, 
but it becomes superconductive and uh, superconductive uh, metal from its uh, high frequency properties. You need to be modeled very carefully because of some anomalous conductions. There is some quantum issue, yeah. a very special one, which you need to consider to reduce. Yeah, uh, it's something interesting, yes. In, a, in our case, the, uh, I'm going to focus in infrared, and we are not using superconductive. But uh, uh, there is uh, some reasons to, well, the reason to, to violate the value of principle. If you are right, with superconductors at uh, lower frequencies, the superconductor is not uh, a good uh, conductor uh, for very high frequencies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that could be a reason also to, to get far from the biometrics. Yeah, yeah, it could be some motivation or where uh, some experimental demonstration can be possible. So therefore, maybe it's easy to get yeah. it. But it will be a different work. Yeah, it, is. <laughs> it will be for that, for that idea. Uh, you need a new theory, different to the theory I'm going to show you. Uh, okay. Uh, then most of what I read you here about the application was for the bolometer, and bolometer should act like uh, the receiving antenna. Uh, to illuminate the bolometer, and then uh, uh, later you can measure the temperature uh, indirectly by measure some voltage. Uh, but then it was like a receiving antenna. What if you want to, to use the an antenna like a emitting antenna? It's difficult because it's very difficult to make a nano source. Nano antenna is difficult, but nano source is much more difficult. Uh, th there is this paper by Gia and others in 2021, uh, proposing to put, they are proposing to, to place a quantum nanodot at the center of this bow tie antenna. Maybe that could be an option. Uh, they were also claiming that the positioning of the quantum nanodot at the center uh, is not very difficult because uh, actually uh, there, there is some resonance. Uh, at the, just at the center, there has this uh, a strong enhancement of the electric field at the center, and then the quantum dot is attracted to the center automatically. It's something like that. Uh, later, you can eliminate the quantum dot, and uh, it will be the source of, of that nano thing. Well, uh, with this, I'm going to finish the, the introduction. I have some problems with the I don't know why sometimes. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, well, I, I finished with the part of the introduction about potential applications. And, uh, but still, I'm in the introduction. Now, Babin's principle. Uh, here, you see two uh, complementary screens. Uh, well, Babin's principle principle may tell you that uh, the transmitted electromagnetic field plus the uh, uh, of the original problem plus the electromagnetic field of the complementary problem is the incident one. Uh, actually the electric field of the original problem plus the magnetic field of the complementary one remember that uh, let me remind you that uh, in the complementary problem by duality you have to interchange the electric field with the magnetic field so electric field plus the magnetic field will be the incident electric field. Uh, and this is the dual equation of the first one. But with these two equations, actually, you can also write a, a more easy, a easier, a easier corollary uh, like this. Transmission coefficient for y polarization plus transmission coefficient for x polarization of the complementary problem. Uh, this prime means complementary uh, is equal one. You add the transmission coefficients of two complementary screens, you should get one. Uh, but uh, let me remind you, uh, polarization state should be rotated by 90 degrees also. If you want some uh, demonstration, you can find demonstrations in Jackson's book or Collins' book. Uh, I will uh, review the, the color line. I will assume the Babinon principle uh, in this form. 
uh, it's demonstrated, for instance, in Jackson's book. And then if we assume some plane wave is impeding onto the surface, let's say this is the, the original surface, this is the complementary one, and this is a plane wave impeding onto the surface. In the complementary problem, I will use a, a plane wave which is like this, but rotated by 90 degrees. The, the polarization state was rotated 90 degrees. Uh, well, you know that for plane waves, a uh, magnetic field is mainly a wave vector times electric field. Um, this is basically like applying a uh, 90 degree rotation. If you rotate by 90 degree the electric field, you will get a magnetic field. So, uh, I will take this equation, the uh, transmitted field, electric field, can be written in terms of the incident field, transmission coefficients multiplied by the incident field should be transmitted field. And also, I will consider that the magnetic field is like the electric field rotated by 90 degrees, so this is the reason of this uh, rotation matrix here. Uh, Finally, you have this equation. Uh, actually, this equation is the same as this, just some algebra uh, in between. Um, finally, if I normalize the equation by dividing by the incident electric field, I get this. So, uh, this uh, shape of the Babinus principle uh, drives me to, to, to this uh, corollary, assuming that uh, the incident field is a plane wave. Also, the scatter, reflected, and transmitted waves are plane waves. Not always it is true. Uh, but I'm very interested in metasurface. You know that for metasurface, the size of the unit cell is much smaller than the wavelength. And then, diffraction uh, uh, is avoided. Diffraction. Is avoided once the periodicity is smaller than lambda over 2. And actually, our unit cell is going to be much smaller than, than lambda over 2. So uh, we can assume that transmitted reflective waves are plane waves. Well, some time ago, we were, uh, I, I, I was involved in, the, in, this, uh, in, in this research in the microwaves. Uh, we were making uh, screens of uh, split resonators and complementary SRRs. You see in this result, this is a transmission coefficient versus a frequency. This is clearly a, a, a range of frequency in microwaves. Um, there is some frequency shift between the stop band and the plus bands of these two complementary structures. It is due to the effect of the dielectric. There is some dielectric. A substrate which is affecting differently to, to each structure. For one of them, uh, the, the sun frequency shift, uh, fre frequency shift. Uh, for the other one, uh, we can observe a, a blue, uh, blue shift of the frequency. Well, what about uh, optics? Because that result was obtained for microwaves. In optics, there are some uh, some papers. Maybe the, the most interesting is this one by Fengraf in 2007. They were making very uh, well nanoscale nano uh, versions of our samples, uh, uh, and basically they demonstrated that the ex Spectra for transmittance is very similar for, for well actually the transmittance of this structure is similar to the reflectance of the complementary structure. Well, there are other studies about uh, the violation of the Babinus principle. Uh, actually, not only the violation, but the, um, qualitative uh, validity of the Babinus principle and the limitations of the Babinus principle. Also, in this paper in 2019, uh, observed that the, there are some limitations, that qualitatively the uh, Babinus principle is true, but uh, some, uh, of course, there are some limitations. 
we did also this paper uh, recently in 2021 uh, we, we got the publication finally uh, this is about the saturation of the resonant frequency again the same structure with the SRR, the complementary SRR uh, we were using silver, some dielectric acid with a very low permittivity and very transparent and you can see the structures here we were trying with periodicity going from two microns to half a micron we were reducing the geometry scaling all the parameters at the same time from uh, that you can imagine the periodicity is 2000 nanometers at the end it is 500 nanometers but the, the, the proportions of the figure are always the same it is only some uh, scaling of the geometry Scaling down the geometry, one could expect that the resonant frequency is going to, to grow, but not linearly forever, because uh, the, the properties of material uh, are important. And then there is some uh, phenomenon of saturation. Actually, that saturation phenomenon was uh, uh, predicted in 2004 by uh, so and others. 2004, I think, yes. Um, well, finally, we, we got a way to, to demonstrate that, but let me tell you that the saturation of the, of the two structures is not happening at the same resonant frequency. Uh, in the horizontal axis, you can see the, the inverse of the period. It means that when the uh, structure, the, the unifel is being made more smaller, smaller and smaller, then you are moving in that direction. So for, for periodicity, it's smaller and smaller. We were suspecting something like resonant frequency is increasing, but there is some saturation phenomenon. It, it will not increase indefinitely to, to, to infinite, let's say. Well, uh, so Bang's principle is violated, but uh, partially it is true. And I was very curious uh, when it is violated, when it is not, and also uh, if it is not violated, why? Anyway, let me show you some uh, relatively easy theorem. This is not the exact theorem, this is very approximated theorem. Let's uh, assume two, ge two geometries like this. It could be the original one and the complementary one. In the original problem, I have some permittivity. Actually, you see, I'm considering a two-dimensional problem. Theta uh, Cartesian coordinate is not included here, so permittivity is depending on x and y. Uh, electric field, the same. This is the gradient operator. And uh, for a electros quasi-static approximation, we could say that divergence of displacement uh, vector is equal to zero. If you assume there is no three shafts, without three shafts, uh, we will write zero here. And the uh, Faraday law can be written like this because uh, there is a, it is a quasi-static approximation. So I'm neglecting the time derivative of magnetic field. In the complementary problem, we should have similar equations for the complementary uh, electric field. Uh, since we are using electro quasi static electro electro quasi static approximation, there is only electric field. In in Babinet's, uh, theorem, we interchange electric field with magnetic field. But in this theorem, the interchange is between electric field and electric field. Okay, but uh, they have something in common. There is a 90 degree rotation of the polarization state. Actually, uh, in this theory, the electric field is like the original one rotated by 90 degrees. This theta with the hat represents the unitary vector along the theta axis. You know that uh, this uh, vector product is the same as the 90 degree rotation along the theta axis. Okay. Uh, alternatively, we can write this theta uh, cross like the matrix of rotation multiplying to, to the electric field. There is some constant here, this C2 constant. It is like a, 
uh, some escaping factors. You can rotate the electric field, but if you want, you can also apply some uh, scaling factor to the to the ele electromagnetic field. Actually, uh, that will depend on the source of the electromagnetic field in this problem. Actually, it is not depicted in the figure. The source could be an incident electromagnetic field, or it could be some source located at the surface. But it is not depicted here. If you have some source and you uh, uh, increment the, the amplitude of the source, then the electric field could be incremented in the same factor. So this is a degree of freedom that depends on the source you are using. Okay, I will define the, the permittivity of the complementary problem like the like this formula. I will take uh, epsilon prime for the complementary structure in such a way that epsilon prime multiplied by epsilon is equal to some constant. This is the way to define the complementary structure. If I go, if I proceed in this way to define the complementary problem, then by using uh, these equations, I can demonstrate these ones. So this is the way to demonstrate that the that uh, the original field is a solution of the electro quasi static approximation equations, this should be also a solution. It is not enough uh, because uh, it's not enough to demonstrate that, uh, that this is a solution, but also that it is uh, in accordance with uh, the boundary conditions of the complementary problem. But actually, uh, it's possible, if you want, you can demonstrate that boundary conditions uh, satisfy here. If they are satisfied here, it will be satisfied here. But actually, this is not really necessary because I'm dealing with the permittivity like a function of x and y. So, believe me, if you put this epsilon prime and e prime in these two equations, you will get these two equations. Actually, this equation will become, the divergence one will become the one with a rotation, the Q, Q of E. And this Q of E prime will become this divergence. Oh, but uh, was it just, this form of epsilon prime, was it just a guess? I mean, to try, or it came from some considerations, uh, some more general considerations? Yes. Uh, or you were just explaining you did different combinations of epsilon and epsilon prime, and then your, your thing is that uh, this, this one fits. Yeah, so you can guess this, that you will have to rotate the electric field. You can put the electric field here and here, and then you will get epsilon prime. I, I understand that it's difficult to guess all this. Why epsilon prime is equal to some constant over epsilon? This is difficult. This is not very difficult because uh, uh, we know uh, the, the conventional Babinus principle. In, in that principle, the polarization state is rotated by 90 degrees. So let's assume it is rotating 90 degrees. Like this. If you assume this, it is quite reasonable. You can put that here and here. In order to recover these two equations, you will have necessary to say that epsilon prime is like this. I think this is the answer. Yes, and also this, this could be seen like a consequence. But you have to, to assume this is the, the electric field of the complementary drug. This will be a, a consequence. Is this all very only for work extremely thin requires of the or maybe it is just a bit of Actually, this is just the, the opposite. For infinitely uh, thick structures. Because this is a two dimensional problem. You mean so, for, for, for how space? Like, uh, uh, for even for it from minus infinity to plus infinity. Well, then the boundary. Ah, okay, so it's, you, you consider it like a medium. Yeah, so the boundaries are only yes. uh, the sum between the buildings. Translation symmetry along the theta axis. But you, at the same time, you consider a quasi electro quasi static approximation. Yes. Which doesn't mean that it will also be weighted for higher frequency. 
Yes, yes. But the, if you assume the, the electromagnetic field is not varying around the theta axis, I think this is not a problem. So it's visual for visualization for transverse representation. Uh, actually, with this formula, you cannot know if it is for transfer electric or transfer magnetic. There is no magnetic field here. It is only electric field. Why would we can take the electrostatic approximation? Well, no, but, but can every other component of electric field uh, are of those uh, z axis? Should be only no, here, in an x y y plane. No. Uh, you see. I'm assuming there is no seed component. Yeah, that's, that, that's a mean equalization. Not directly what is but vector vector should be a transverse to the cylindrical axis. Yeah, and this is important. Yes. So what it comes to the dimensional problem, in fact. Yes. And now, if it is a two-dimensional problem, how can we connect this problem with a uh, with a real three-dimensional problem. <laughs> well, assume, let, let, assume that there is a free space on both sides of this figure, and this, all these permittivities are much bigger than a free space permittivity. They could be negative or positive permittivities, but much bigger than the one of free space. If it is so, uh, by using boundary conditions, you can demonstrate that the the electric field inside the structure should be tangent to the boundary with a free space. That's a way to, to solve that is uh, the, inside the, the structure you have electric field only with the with the x and y components. Uh, but I have to assume that the doubt permittivities are much bigger than the free space permittivity. And then it is a boundary condition that you can apply here. Uh, uh, imagine that uh, what boundary condition? The continuity of the B vector epsilon multiplied by normal component of electric field should be continuous. If you have some finite value of the normal component of electric field outside and permittivity inside is going to infinite, the normal component of electric field inside should be zero. So inside these materials, the the theta component of electric field will be negligible based on with the tangential components. But I'm assuming that permittivities are much bigger than a free space permittivity. At the same time, when permittivity is very big, electroquasistatic approximation can be done because most of the energy is in the electric field. So it's very important for me, uh, well, not for me, for, for this theory, that the, all the permittivities are much bigger than the free space permittivity. That's uh, it. Juan, Juan, wait a second. Uh, but now you say that they all should be much bigger. Do you speak about the original ones or for both cases? Because you still didn't tell what is that C1. Is it a universal constant or is it some function which depends on parameters? Yes, yes. Uh, C1 um, may depend on frequency, for instance, but not on, uh, on coordinates x and y. Right, but is it necessarily a small number, a big number, or because you say, for instance, in your starting problem, you need to have uh, epsilon 1, 2, 3, 4, all of them to be much bigger than unity. Does yeah. it mean that your inverse epsilons should be much smaller now, or your constant is so big that they are also big? Yeah, well, imagine, imagine that you write this uh, relationship in different way. Epsilon multiplied by epsilon prime. Both epsilon and epsilon prime should be much bigger than one. And then you will get a C1, which is uh, much, much bigger than one. So C1 is a huge uh, function, oh. and that's a function of frequency in addition. Yes, always. Well, it, it, uh, but why do you call it, uh, that, that, that's, uh, it's probably a terminological question, but why do you say it's for plasmonics? Because I think with, with the assumptions that you make, it's very, let's say, 
different from actual applicability of plasmonics because you essentially neglect uh, uh, resonance behavior to some extent. Uh, I mean, you cannot use a really elect uh, quasi electrostatic approximation in, in real life plasmonics. Why do you say it's for plasmonics? Well, in plasmonics, uh, you can get a very big permittivity with negative sign. Yes. And uh, actually, the theorem is not uh, specifically for plasmonic. It is, uh, it, it, I, I should say, this is for very high permittivity, or if very high permittivity. But uh, I'm going to use this in plasmonics. Uh, actually, uh, it's more interesting when you can play with uh, positive and negative uh, high permittivities at the same time. So, uh, Actually, I will need all, also some material with uh, positive high permittivity, not only plasmonic material, but uh, some high dielectric uh, constant material at the same time. Yeah, but the antenna will be at the end plasmonic because it is made of uh, silver and it will work in the mini infrared. So, that's the reason to call it uh, plasmonic. That the antenna will be plasmonic, but the theory is not necessarily for plasmonic materials. Okay. Uh, okay then cont let's continue uh, to get the, the impedance we need to, to get the voltage and some carga, some voltage, some carga. Uh, let's calculate the average electric field in the unit cell like this. This is a, a, a kind of average in the area of the unit cell, a means area, and you have some uh, integral of electric field on the area of this square. And for the coupling, you can also uh, make some kind of average of the displacement current density. Actually, this is a, a displacement current. It is not a conducting current. You, you can see uh, we have the time derivative, time derivative of D. This permittivity by multiplied by electric field it should be D vector time derivative. So this is the uh, displacement current density. If you make the average, the average, it is a kind of uh, displacement curve. Yep. In the complementary problem, you have also the possibility to define the, the average electric field of the unit cell and the average uh, displacement current density. Once you have done this, you can divide voltage and current and then get the, the impedance. Let's do that. Uh, Actually, for anisotropic structures, we should tell a matrix impedance, matrix of impedances. And the matrix of impedances is connecting the electric field with the uh, current densities. But actually, let me remind you, these current densities are not electric currents, but displacement currents. Actually, you have dielectrics here. If they are considered dielectrics, they are not metals, or they are not conductors, dielectrics. So this is displacement current. Actually, these permittivities could uh, present some imaginary part. So it can be also, con uh, it, it could also uh, model a, a conductor. Imaginary part of permittivity could be the conductivity. Okay, so and Juan, uh, do you mean here that uh, that relationship which you get for the impedances is now true regardless of specific C1 and C2? I mean, those C1 and C2, are they important essential quantities for the theory? Or you simply say that if the relationship is such with uh, C1 and C2 that satisfies certain limitation, then that is going to happen anyway. Or maybe I'm asking too early, maybe you're going to tell about this. Now, uh, actually, T2 
it's not very important. C2 is a degree of freedom because the a complementary problem could, could have a source stronger or weaker than the original problem. But C1 uh, is, is uh, actually C1 will be important, but it is arbitrary. You, you, you will choose the materials and then you are choosing the value of C1 when you are choosing the materials. I don't know if I replied correctly. Uh, I, I will repeat. Yes, C1 is important. But I yes, mean, yes, but I mean, from theoretical point of view, can you retrieve certain requirements for C1 which you can formulate analytically? Uh, or how actually, it goes? Actually, yes. C1 is the only of the two parameters, C1 and C2, that remains in this formula. Yeah, this is a kind of uh, duality relationship for the for the impedance of the original problem and the complementary one. Yep. And then uh, this is very similar to the Booker's or to the Muchiakis formula. Uh, that formula told us that theta prime multiplied by theta was theta naught square over four. This this is looking different because I'm taking into account the possibility of anisotropic uh, structures. Then uh, they are matrices now. And also, I have to rotate the polarization state by 90 degrees. It is connected with this rotation of one of the impedances. Uh, but just to reply to your question, in this big K function, mm -hmm. we have the C1. So C1 is. Yep. Important at the end. Yeah, it is important yeah. because if you change the value of C1, the, the duality relationship uh, also yes. changes. Yes. yes, yes. And now we can see that the in the main equation, which is in the frame, the right hand part is going to be um, much, much, much smaller than a uh, uh, square of uh, free space impedance. Yes. Uh, okay, so then the product, it looks like it makes some, all right, all right, let, let's see the results because... Uh, yeah, but, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, we agree that C1 is going to be very big, but uh, it depends also on other numbers like H, and H could be very small if, uh, if this is an elementary structure. Actually, the H has units, but K also. Uh, the problem HK could be uh, small if you want. And then uh, it could moderate the value of C1. If, uh, it could moderate the value of K, BK. Anyway, yep. uh, okay, then let's go. Let's continue. Oh, right. So we were publishing this theory in, uh, two years ago in this paper, Extension of the Valence Principle. And then uh, finally we got this formula uh, because actually in the previous slide we have a formula connecting impedances of the original program and complementary program. But uh, since impedance matrix can be connected with the transmission coefficient matrix, that relationship can be introduced to another relationship between transmission coefficients. It, this is only some straightforward algebra. Uh, probably you remember that uh, once you know theta matrix, you can get transmission coefficient matrix. So uh, finally, after some algebra, we can write this formula. This is similar to, to the corollary I wrote a few slides ago for, for the conventional variance principle. Actually, if k, let, let me go further. Imagine that k is equal to 1. If this big k is equal to 1, this bracket is cancelled out, this is identity, and then you can move the terms, and then you will have t plus t prime equal one actually like this. Don't, don't forget the rotation matrix. T plus A prime rotated by 90 degree equal identity. Actually, you can write the, in this way also, and then maybe it sounds better for you. T plus T prime is equal one, 
Uh, but then we have also, we are also taking into account the, 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 the components of transmission coefficients which are not in the, in the diagonal. See that here, for the case there are some cross polar effects. One way to, to get uh, some complementary problem, uh, or maybe from an original geometry, uh, you want to get a complementary geometry. One uh, trivial way is just to interchange the materials, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, while keeping the boundaries. You see the, the boundaries in the geometry are not being uh, changed from, from the left figure to the, to the figure in, on the right side, but we are interchanging the material, the colors of the regions. Then it's, it is very clear that the, the product of epsilon 1, epsilon 2 is equal to the product of epsilon 2 and epsilon 1. That was the, the way to define the complementary problem, that the product of epsilon and epsilon prime should be a, a constant. Well, uh, I think this, this slide is very important. I'm going to propose to use silicon because it is a material with a permittivity about 12, and also silver. Why silver? Well, this is very commonly used in plasmonics, and this is one of the metals uh, that uh, present a very low collision frequency, so it is good if you want to reduce the losses in the structure. The, the drill model uh, for silver will be described with this formula. In this formula, you see the plasma frequency, the collision frequency. This is the plasma frequency, the collision frequency. Imagine that we are working at a frequency which is much bigger than the, fre the collision frequency and at the same time much smaller than the plasma frequency. When omega is much smaller, or maybe, maybe it is better to start from here, omega much bigger than gamma then this gamma can be, can be, could be neglected. Let's imagine it is neglected, okay? But, and then, uh, at the same time, omega much smaller than uh, plasma frequency. So this number will be much bigger than one. Then you can neglect also the one. Finally, we have this approximation. It's going to be valid when the frequency is much bigger than the plasma, sorry, much bigger than the collision frequency, but much smaller than the plasma frequency. Is it, is it possible? Yes, because for most, uh, well, for, for the specific case of the silver, the collision frequency is, well, between two and three orders of magnitude smaller than the plasma frequency. So there is a, you can see the, the exponents here, 13 and 16. There is plenty of space in frequency <laughs> uh, to, to have a big window of frequency in which this approximation is true. Why this is interesting for me? Because uh, permittivity of silver will depend on frequency like omega to minus two. If you see this big function k, uh, it is depending on several factors, like wave number squared, wave number is proportional to frequency. Some of these permittivities could be for silver, and then we have omega to minus two, omega squared, and the dependence with frequency will be uh, canceled, canceled out, assuming the other permittivity is a constant value. So if we are using silicon, which, is, uh, which uh, presents a constant permittivity, and silver with a permittivity that can be approximated like omega to minus two, then this big K will become a constant function, like the plot uh, on the right side of the slide. Actually, we are plotting here for the specific case of uh, thickness H equal 12.7 nanometer. Why this? this thickness, because we want to get big K equal one. With a big K equal one, we can recover the conventional uh, Babinus principle. And, and uh, this H is just for this particular epsilon of, of uh, silicon, yeah? Yes. Well, why, what if you take uh, just vacuum? 
But the problem with vacuum is that in general, uh, our approximation is not good because it means that some of these two media, maybe, well, let's say this, this is vacuum. And then the, I was assuming the theta component of the electric field inside the medium was negligible. That could be uh, false for vacuum. It depends on the geometry. Sometimes it is possible. For instance, uh, imagine this unit cell is a split film resonator, and the electric field is very well concentrated uh, uh, in a gap, very tiny gap. Then it works. If the electric field is very concentrated in a gap, and you know the electric field is on the XY plane, it works. But uh, once the fringing effects are important and the electric field can get out from the XY plane, then the, the, the assumptions of our theorems are wrong and then it, it doesn't work. We want to be general. We want that uh, uh, in order to, to be general, uh, the, all permittivities in the geometry should be uh, much bigger than the free space permittivity. Right, Juan. But with this thickness, I mean, with these realistic materials, that's a very small thickness. So you should expect some remarkable deviations from uh, uh, bulk parameters. Essentially, uh, that, that composite sheet which you will produce will be probably fairly transparent altogether because of the small thickness. Is yeah. that a... Yes. Uh... We have to do some, some research in that direction, but what you are saying uh, could be important for collision frequency. Uh, plasma frequency is not very much affected by the thickness of the material, but uh, collision frequency is affected, really. Uh, because the, when the thickness of the material is uh, very small, uh, from the, well, the, the, the mean free uh, path, mean free path, uh, will be smaller, and then it will affect to the to the collision frequency. Collision frequency will be higher, but actually, uh, it is not going to be a big problem. It will be a reduction. It, it will mean it will mean a reduction of the window of frequency in which the approximation is true, because the, this uh, uh, collision frequency is a kind of a minimum frequency uh, of, of, the, of the range of frequency for which the, the theory is working. So probably the, the small thickness of the structure is going to, to push up this, uh, this, this small frequency. For now, the collision frequency is about 5 terahertz. And, and so, uh, for 5 terahertz, our BK function is not uh, near 1. What should be the problem if uh, we increase the collision frequency? That uh, this, this peak here of the imaginary part that corresponds actually with a 5J terahertz uh, will uh, shift to higher frequencies. But I'm not expecting a uh, bigger than 50 terahertz. Mm much smaller than 50 terahertz. So it is not going to be a very big problem. Uh, I was doing some estimations, uh, but I actually have to, to do it uh, more rigorously. But uh, in my estimations, uh, I, I'm almost sure that uh, from 20 uh, terahertz, uh, to this peak probably will move to 20 terahertz for this for this thickness. I'm not very sure now about the data, but I'm sure that from 50 terahertz, everything looks very similar. And also the estimation is very easy. The estimation is by taking, uh, I, I was doing the next, uh, I was assuming the mean free path was equal to the thickness of the sample. Because this thickness is much smaller than the, than the mean free path in the bulk silver. So this is the worst case. In the worst case, uh, 
I don't remember exactly the, the number, but the collision frequency was, I think, like 20 terahertz instead of 5 terahertz. Then it means uh, this window of frequency will, will not start uh, at 50, maybe a bit bigger frequency. What do you think, Eric? Hey? Uh, well, probably yes. Well, it's not the only effect I suspect, but uh, I, anyway, we it, it would. I, I need some time to to think on more uh, criticism, if you wish. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, oh, well, actually, I'm going to skip many slides. <laughs> and I will go to the to the main part of the talk because uh, if you go to that paper about the station of one of principles, you will find several examples, many examples, but in the paper only three examples, but they have many more. But for this thickness of uh, about 13 nanometers, E plus T prime, the addition of the transmission coefficients is approximately equal one. But this was just to uh, okay. I, I will move to the to the very important part of this talk. I'm taking too much time, and then I will go to the self-complementary antennas. Uh, let's assume that the uh, this we can be recovered for for that specific thickness of 12.7 nanometers. And then, uh, okay, let me, let me remind you one of the self-complementary antennas which I was proposing. The spiral one. This spiral, uh, this is self-complementary because uh, when you interchange free space and perfect electric conductor, it is the same geometry, but uh, rotated uh, by, by 90 degrees. Maybe it is easier to see in this, uh, uh, magnify uh, figure, which is part of the center of the spider antenna. You can interchange perfect electric conductor and the white region, gray and white, and then uh, and, uh, just after you can rotate 90 degrees and the structure will be the same. So this is self complementary. On the left, you have the case of the perfect electric conductor antenna. On the right side, you have uh, the, the structure made with silver and silver. Both were made with the same dimensions. Uh, I want to compare the results. So, uh, you, uh, this is not very realistic to say that perfect electric conductor can be approximated in this uh, in, in infrared uh, working with this uh, nanometric uh, Dimension. Well, maybe nanometric dimension has no problems, but uh, I want to work in the infrared. So, perfect electric conductor is not a good approximation for for conductors, for metals, metals. Uh, but still, uh, in a simulator, we can we can play with perfect electric conductor like a boundary condition. On a wasp thickness, this example would be. Uh, we will try several thickness. Here it is H, and H will be different values. One of them will be the uh, in between quotes, the good one of 12.7 nanometers. And we will try uh, around that value, like 5 nanometers, 10 nanometers, 20 nanometers around. Then uh, in this case, uh, the yellow color is uh, what you can see here silver and silicon is the cyan color. We are using this type of source. Uh, the source is also important. Uh, this is not a point source. Uh, I was proposing to use point source. Uh, I'm using, uh, we, are, we, we have a several things, but here I am using a source that can be considered self complementary. This is a uh, a local source in, in CSD, which is called S4, S4 local source or local port, local port, yes, uh, uh, with uh, S parameters. 
And then you can say that the, the reference impedance of this source is somebody. I have a short sent the free space impedance. Uh, no, free space impedance over two in this case. If you, if you take that uh, reference uh, impedance, we can demonstrate that the equivalent uh, surface current. I don't know how to say. Yeah, the, the, the magnetic field on this side of the source and the electric field are related by uh, free space impedance. We, we can go to that later. I think it's not a good idea to, to say this now. It, but, okay, let's, let's move to, we can go back to the point. Uh, this is the impedance, the input impedance of the antenna. Uh, there is a gray curve here, uh, which corresponds, uh, maybe you see the gray curve, it corresponds to the perfect electric conductor with thickness equal zero. The other, the color curves, it corresponds with the antenna made of silicon and silicon uh, for different values of the thickness. The blue curve corresponds with the value of 12.7 nanometers, but you have others. Red one for 5 nanometers and so on. Uh, let me repeat, my <laughs> let me repeat. Perfect electric conductor with thickness equal zero is the gray line. It is the one that uh, Almost you cannot see here, but uh, this was what to see. Yes. Uh, for the perfect electric conductor nanotera, the value of the input impedance is just about 188 uh, ohms. This is the expected value proposed by, by Muchiake. Uh, it is not exactly 188, but relatively near. Yeah? With the uh, uh, with a silicon and silver, we can get something very similar for this thickness. But if you move around, like uh, H equal 5 nanometers, then there are important deviations in the input impedance, as you can see here. Uh, or actually, the imaginary part of the uh, input impedance, which is the dashed line, is also different from zero. Uh, if you move to the opposite, uh, uh, a string value, 25 nanometer, that I have tried, <laughs> uh, then deviations are also important. Um, well, if you try between 10 and 15 nanometers, deviations uh, uh, are not very important, really. You, you, you can see here the, the yellow and the, the green curve, they are not very far from the value of 188, but it depends on what you consider far or near. <laughs> but, uh, I mean that uh, uh, the... Uh, okay, I mean that if you make some uh, mistake of one or two nanometers in the thickness of the, of the silver uh, silicon, maybe the, the deviation could be considered acceptable not more than two nanometers. That's interesting, Juan, because you have a quadratic dependence on H. So in fact, between H, uh, between green and yellow, there is a two time, more than two times difference in a K, in big K. And it's still almost invisible. Yes. Do you have any qualitative explanation for that? Because I, I, when you first showed that, I expected that you are going to have very sharp dependence and be extremely sensitive to, to the thickness. Yes. It is quadratic, but it is still proportional to the absolute value of both primitive. So maybe it depends on part of these primitive numbers. Well, it is difficult for me to see now. But the, the, yeah, the square, yeah, this k square is in the denominator. Uh, 
I kind of give you. Oh, all right, let let's let's talk about this later because it's yes. uh, yeah. Uh, in any case, you have much more slides than you have shown, so I want to look through them all some, sometime. Yes, but uh, I will, as you mentioned, the decay depends on 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 h square, so h square. But the way in which a square enter in the Musiakis, in the modified Musiakis relation is like this. Uh, a square is in the denominator, and maybe the effect is not very, uh, I don't know. Yeah, but I think if, if you change h in comparison to the optimal one, uh, you, you can expand the key. From its original number of one to some yes. series, and maybe this uh, this correction between uh, twelve point seven and fifteen will be not so so extreme in this expansion. Okay, around one. Yes. Yeah, uh, we have to basically we have to make some uh, error expansion. Yeah, so <laughs> this, this yes. error this error is proportional not to h square but to uh, the difference between optimal yeah, range is and the next one. Yeah, impedance is a function of H, so we should make a, a Taylor expansion and see what, what is the effect of a, a variation of H. When H is equal to the, the ideal value of H plus some delta H, what is the effect of uh, theta? What, what is the delta, delta theta for some delta H? It can be done. <laughs> it is easy. I don't know now. At some moment, probably uh, after we do the derivative, uh, probably we we'll see that uh, this dependence on h square is not so important. Probably. Well, uh, on the right side of this slide, we can see the, the efficiency. This is a total efficiency. It means the uh, Aviated power divided by the uh, power entering in the antenna. The, the power is stimulated by the source. This uh, total efficiency uh, is uh, relatively high, uh, uh, from 50 to 300 terahertz. Actually, from 100 terahertz to 300 terahertz, it is uh, uh, always higher than 90 percent for the for the case of the thickness between 10 and 15 nanometers yeah. it's, it's noticeable that the uh, efficiency uh, reaches its optimum uh, exactly at this uh, balanced uh, yes. situation also uh, the issues with custom explanation not Yes. Probably once you have some uh, extra reactants, you will also decrease efficiency because of uh, field is going to concentrate somewhere. But this efficiency is high mainly because of the impedance match. Because the source uh, was uh, having the same impedance as the input impedance of the antenna. We were trying with a uh, Reference interest uh, at the source equals theta naught over two, and it is stated that the same interest is the input interest of the antenna. But what this is the main reason of the high efficiency. But what happens with the radiation efficiency when well, you avoid this uh, issue of uh, reflection, but you leave also some dissipation? Yeah, yeah, it is not one hundred percent because of dissipation. Mm -hmm. okay. Can you say that the radiation efficiency will be will be optimal in the optimal case for what kind of radiation efficiency is actually uh, because we can assume that this flat behavior of impedance is uh, associated with the absence of uh, reactants, and if so, it means that the uh, electric field is not you know concentrated much somewhere. So probably the radiation efficiency also reaches its maximum. It's interesting to check. Yeah, actually, radiation efficiency is the same as total efficiency in this in that case. You see? 
No, because the HTTP doesn't account for reflection and input. Mid, uh, I mean, impedance mismatch is not taken into account in the initial efficiency. But uh, probably there are some effects uh, which make it also optimal uh, for when you have such flat behavior of impedance. Meaning that you have a uh, minimum of uh, reactive power, reactive energy concentrated in the body structure. Therefore, the dissipation uh, losses could also be minimal. That's all it's interesting to be checked. Yes, I'm thinking. Yeah, but there is, a, there is something that, that is not very good. Yeah, we, we can discuss later. Mm, I, I want to think a bit more. <laughs> but, uh, okay, the, the energy is going from the source to the antenna. If there is good impedance matching, it goes easy to the antenna. But later, the energy has to go from the antenna to the free space. Yes, and so, in, in this process, it's very important how much your uh, reactive uh, it's energy is localized. It's also important that the uh, input impedance uh, is taken out of to get some impedance and matching with the free space. Yes, definitely. And that, that the reactive part it, it tends to zero, which means you don't have uh, concentration special concentration of uh, reactive energy. Yes. That's true. That's true. But probably this is associated with optimum of radiation uh, efficiency. Well, the fact that it is uh, imaginary. Okay. The input impedance has probably imaginary part, but not a real part. Okay, this is related with uh, having different permittivities. Different sign of the permittivity, sorry. Different sign of permittivity. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. now I understand the point. Yeah, actually, K, this K, which is, okay, this K, K is possible. Aha, this is possible. So the the input into us as far as possible. Okay. Well, anyway, I'm going to to discuss it later because we have kind of limited time for the seminar. Yeah, 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 yeah. But let me. Well, yeah. It is very important, but, but this is a, okay. This is a, actually this is important. Why silicon and silver, uh, one of them with positive permittivity, the other one with negative permittivity? One aspect could be that uh, then uh, you get this uh, uh, theta square. Theta square is equal to theta naught square with four k. Then it is positive. BK will be positive if they have different sign of the of the sign, the different different sign of permittivity. If they was the if they uh, were the same sign, uh, then it would be negative, and then the impedance would be imaginary. And then uh, it is connected. This impedance is real. Connected with, with, with the fact that permittivity has opposite signs. And with that, those signs of permittivity, this imaginary part of the input impedance must be here. There is no other way. Any frequency? Uh, 
we can discuss later. Uh, in your case, it's something similar to compensation of reactants in the reactor circuits. When you have a parallel connection of uh, capacitor and inductor, and in both elements you have some losses. In this case, losses are uh, with reduced losses. They are somehow balanced. You, you, you can measure the frequency constant response. Uh, even despite the fact that there is capacitor and inductor, which should actually have some frequency dependence. Maybe it's something similar. So, in this case, for a blue light, for a blue light, for a blue light. Yeah, yeah, I, I know, but you, you can also compose an electric circuit composed of uh, capacitor and inductor, where both have uh, some resistor connected in series in both branches of the circuit. And it will also have a frequency constant that is very real and uh, frequency constant. At any frequency. Yes. That's right. Well, let me move to the, to the last slide. This is the, the radiation pattern of the two uh, uh, self complementary spiral antennas. Uh, you see how they are very similar. Uh, the, Maximum of the activity is also similar, about 4 dBi. And 4 dBi, uh, they are not exactly equal, but they are similar. Uh, this is the radiation pattern for the case of, uh, uh, I remember it was for 150 terabytes, at 150 terabytes. But if we change the frequency, it is uh, mostly the same shape. Uh, it is not depending much on the frequency. This is specific for 150 terabytes. And then, uh, well, nothing more to say here. And I will conclude with this. Well, uh, some question. Uh, so, what about current distribution? You know, you feed it from the center, but there should be some distribution of parameters. So should it be the same in these two situations? Very similar. Very similar. And then, actually, it's. Uh, it's Okay, uh, due to the lack of time, <laughs> it was impossible to add more, more monitors. But this is important. The capital uh, is concentrated in the central part. Actually, uh, there is a limitation for, for making self complementary structures. The, 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 the antennas, the antenna must be finite and in size, but big enough in order to be considered like infinite, because uh, once it is finite, it cannot be rigorously self complementary because uh, the, this part of the antenna, far from the center, if you change metal with, uh, interchange the metal with, uh, with the free space, then in the complementary structure it should be metal. But it will be again free space. So this is not a rigorous self complementary structure because it is fine. But there is no problem if the current is not reaching the edge of the antenna. You can actually surround by absorber. Maybe. With some certain uh, resistivity, uh, surface resistivity. Yes. And solve the problem of its final size. It could be. It could be. Uh, well, but, uh, and the, the current was very similar for. But, but in this case, this is electric current. This is interesting. Here you have electric current. Here you have only displacement current. Even the one structure, I thought. And then you have to, to see the, the, the electric field. If you model this uh, structure with negative, uh, negative primitivity, can, can you say that inside there is some conductance? You could. But uh, it is mainly displacement current. But why displacement? I mean, it's like plasma when it is in, in the conducting state, right? Yes. Yeah, we say that it is because uh, it has some, if, uh, some spot. current uh, charged particles uh, can, can freely move inside, which causes this issue of negative Actually, energy. Yeah. Without conductance, it's hard probably to imagine. Uh, probably you can see that uh, the that current like both. You know, but, 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 some, but some of them should dominate. It should be related to the phase difference between the new current and the electric field at the same point. For me, it is maybe it's mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, actually, uh, the uh, is uh, almost brilliant. 
and it leads in some experience in, in, in this range of factors. Negative, very big and negative, but real. Imaginary bias in English in, in the period. So uh, I see this is this spectrum capture. If you want to see some, uh, well, the, the, the conducting current is associated with conductivity. And conductivity is the imaginary part of permittivity. And I'm telling you that permittivity is not free in this range of terms. For, for 150 terms, it is very real permittivity. Yeah, you will have a, okay, I, I think the point is that the collision frequency is much smaller than the plasma frequency. I, I'm working at a frequency which is far, very far from the collision frequency. So the, 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 the current is maybe displacement current. To be, uh, to observe uh, that the current is, uh, well, if you want that the dominant current is the conducting current, you should go to much smaller frequencies of the order of the collision frequency, or smaller than the collision frequency. And then the, the dominant current will be the conducting one. I'm sure. Yes. But at 150 terahertz, which is much bigger than 5 terahertz, for, for silver, the plasma, the, the collision frequency was 5 terahertz. So we are very far from the collision frequency uh, at much bigger frequency. So this is displacement current. I'm sure. Maybe. Yeah, but physically, yeah. exactly. the, the material, I mean, in microscopic point of view, what happens with particles? Should some molecules that are polarizing? Yeah. Can it be achieved with, without electrons? Of course, the materials, everything is possible, but we know that. Yeah, this is a short. <laughs> uh, I, I think this collected uh, oxidation of the shafts. Oh, of any terms. Yeah. Not, 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 not just molecules. Yeah, and they are actually electrons. I'm interpreting the current like displacement current, but uh, it is actually electrons oxidating, but, uh, but not free current. Okay, but you cannot just hold the current, but they physically is related with electrons moving away. Okay. Yes. Um, well, there is something interesting here yeah, about the about the source. I was uh, trying to. I, I have tried many things. For instance, to rotate ninety degree the, the source. The source uh, that I am using is self complementary in the sense that the the electric magnetic field uh, around this source uh, are related by the free space impedance. Uh, but if I rotate 90 degree the source, uh, the input impedance is not 188 ohms. We far from, from that value. Why? Because the polarization is not, 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 not proper one. But the geometry is self complementary. Yeah, but they need to replace it by magnetic one. Do you have a little it, it is self complementary. It is self complementary. I will tell you why. No, 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 but in the center, you still have to, to follow the uh, structure pattern. And if you rotate it, then effectively you violate self complementarity in the center. Oh, no, why? Why? The geometry, the, the geometry is self complementary. And I, I mean that uh, if I rotate the, the source, it should be self complementary. The source is also self complementary. Because this source uh, means that uh, the, the relation between electric field and magnetic field around, or in other words, the relation between the current uh, crossing this red line and the voltage uh, along this blue line is connected by theta naught. For instance, for the first the structure A, you cannot do it, but it cannot be. The electric uh, no, but, but, in multiple direction. Yes, yes, and the same for your structures. No, 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 I agree no. with us. No, but uh, 
why not to rotate 90 degrees this? The only difference is that you are trying to, to push the charges, uh, the movement of the charges along the silicon strips. Yes. What's the problem? Or vacuum in this case. Because the vacuum, there are no yeah, charges. I, I agree, I agree that it sounds strange. If I put the source rotating 90 degrees here, why if uh, this is vacuum? Am I trying to excite a current in vacuum? Yeah. But this is a material, silicon. But also there are no... no, no uh, I can't I can excite these placement currents in silicon. This is a dielectric. Actually, you can also excite these placement currents in, in vacuum. No, but, but I agree with, with Stas. It's a different excitation type because here, uh, you, you would have uh, more or less a singular point in the center, but in fact, you replace it all by the source. And now because your source has finite size, then effectively you, you, it becomes dependent on orientation because at that stage, it is important, roughly speaking, if you can imagine continuing silicon and silver, but you flip it when you continue your spiral, you will destroy your property. And similarly, when you replace that remaining part of your structure with some source, again, you need to follow a certain guidelines. So you cannot now rotate it 90 degrees. In the same, for the same reason for which you cannot cut an arbitrary size square within your structure and just rotate it 90 degrees, right? Because then you would be replacing materials and you will have, uh, you will actually destroy your structure. Yeah, but I, but I think that's it. Yes. Yeah, just imagine a bigger square still centered uh, inside in, in the center of the structure, right? Yes. If you rotate it 90 degrees now, you will see that you will change your materials. You will obtain some material borders between silicon and silver, and your structure will not be double a spiral anymore. But now you are just doing this in the center, but that center, it, it still should should be consistent with your overall geometry. So I think Stas is right. You need to drive currents between pieces of silver and you need to, to make displacement current between silicon pieces and not vice versa. I'm not sure. Uh, for instance, uh, let's take this figure, which is easier. <laughs> If you rotate the, the, this big square, the, well, actually, this is not very big. If you take this and rotate 90 degrees, maybe you break the geometry, but not the self complementarities. What is the thing about that? Because the structure is anisotropic. So, so uh, it's not the same thing if you uh, apply all the vertical or uh, But I don't understand your point. If I rotate 90 degrees this square here, or this square, it will. Self but, but this is only for effectively zero size, but because you have non-zero size, then uh, it's not that easy. But for zero size, once again, it's it's uh, not but, but the, the problem will be different. If, if I rotate 90 degrees this square, uh, there will appear some contact points that are always very difficult for, for simulation. And also, probably, they, they are some kind of fundamental issue, really. Because if I rotate 90 degrees this square, there will be some corners there. They are problematic. Uh, now I think I understand. So it will still be self complementary. Yes. And in principle, we should have, again, some uh, frequency independent impedance. But this impedance will be so poor and, and so sensitive to the limitation that uh, its real reactance will be immediately comparable to the parasitic reactance of the linear, linear field. Yes. But, so but you, can, I, you, can, you cannot even play yeah, this. But, but I, I was uh, imagining the rotation of this square, because you, you suggested that. <laughs> but uh, actually, the, the rotation of the source is not creating any contact points. Yeah, but somehow it is, uh, the structure is excited, but, but very poorly. I agree with that. Actually, from the beginning, I tried this, this orientation of the source because this was the natural one. I, 
I have to, to stimulate the cavern to go to the civil street. This is the natural, the natural way. But then later, I was thinking, well, well if I rotate the, the source, is it impossible? Maybe uh, uh, it sounds less natural, but uh, why not? I can rotate the source, still the geometry is self complementary. It, it's maybe better to. But why, why, why do you say, why do you are saying that the. Uh, why do you say that the. That, uh, that the excitation is pure when you rotate 19 degrees of the Because usually we connect the source to the conductor so and then about not exactly. Exactly. For some reasons, I uh, just. Exactly. For that reason, I, I thought at the beginning that the, the natural way is from silver to silver. Yeah, we put the, the source from silver to silver. But I don't have any other reason to reject from silicon to silicon. If you, <laughs> if you try that with uh, contact lights, Let's say using some near field coupling to some external small antenna. You would get this because if you rotate it by 90 degrees, it will still work. But you, you need contact less uh, near field connection. Let's say you have a dipole and with port and you put it close to a structure and rotate the dipole vertically. Uh, if it is self complementary, you can rotate it and have the same thing. Should not change the opinion. Yes. But when you connect the port, you break the uh, self complementariness. Ah. You have to discuss it. I don't see how, how, we do, uh, how there is a problem that it is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we can understand it. Yes, I think it's a very easy way. Yeah. From this spot to outside is self complementary, and the source is self complementary. It doesn't matter if I put the line to the source. The whole system should be self complementary. But if it is a component, yes, it should be 188 inside. It should be some easy to close the computer, but it's very hard to calculate it because of uh, different, different parasitic effects in this one. Well, then just uh, I, I, I should finish with the <laughs> Well, uh, Okay, Babin principle was uh, recovered for for plasmonic metasurface. Uh, at least we, we we have some approximation that uh, allow us to say that it is almost recovered. Specifically for silicon and silver, and some uh, thickness of 12.7 nanometers, uh, it works very well between 50 and 300 terahertz. And then we, we thought that maybe it could be used to design uh, self complementary nano antennas uh, with an input impedance of 188 ohms at any frequency. Uh, actually, it is not for any, any frequency. In the mid infrared, it worked very well. It must be uh, in a window of frequencies uh, with a minimum much bigger than the collision frequency. And a maximum much smaller than the plasma frequency of the silver. Uh, well, it's remarkable also that we got a total efficiency of uh, more than 90 percent between 100 terahertz and 300 So, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank also Susana, Salina, uh, Inti Ruiz, who is a student in National University of Colombia. Uh, Juan Pablo Barrisco, because they, they are helping me a lot with the uh, Lucas inventions. There are many things to do, actually. Uh, thank you, Juan. So, now I think we have some time for uh, maybe uh, additional questions. So, if, uh, if somebody has one, please uh, raise your hand in, in Zoom or maybe in the audience. Uh, please be free to, to ask. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paul. So I have a question related uh, to 
let's say, general vision of this uh, research direction. So, you know, this uh, nano antenna direction was studied a lot of, let's say, 10 years ago, and there were a lot of works related to plasmonic nano antennas. After that, it was a lot of hype of all dielectric nano antennas in terms of, let's say, omic losses. And that there is no only glasses there. So, and my, my vision is the following. So, what do you want here? So, you want to design one more type of nano antenna to demonstrate that okay, it's working. It's not working very well in optics, but let's say targets will work well. So, what is the, let's say, big motivation behind this research? Well, maybe. <coughs> Fundamental motivation. Fundamental. Maybe. <laughs> no, I mean, like, maybe you, you see from your, let's say, fundamental point of view where you will, this, these things can be used in, in real life. Or, or there is some fundamental problem which is not answered here, there, that can be very, very interesting. There are many fundamental issues. I'm thinking how to start the, the answer. Because this is a. Yeah? Okay, I, I would say several things. Uh, we want broadband behavior. So, we believe that uh, which is independent of the frequency is good for broadband behavior. That could be the least. But uh, also, uh, we were reading several papers uh, about uh, sp spiral antennas look better for broadband behavior. And then I was asking myself, why? Why this uh, antenna could be better than others? Why the, uh, the response of the self complementary spiral antenna is better than the type or one? Well, maybe it is related with the Muchiakis idea, but actually, Muchiakis' uh, relationship is not true in plasmonic. And people working with the spiral antennas are using the Mushiakis idea, but they, there is something strange because uh, Mushiakis ideas work very well for good conductors. In plasmonics, silver is not a good conductor, so there is a fundamental question. If, uh, also, another fundamental question is that uh, in Mushiakis, is uh, complementary antennas, you need to use a point source. When the nano antenna is nano, what's the meaning of a point source? Point source is something much smaller than the nano antenna. So it should be an atom? Should it be an atom? <laughs> quantum dot. Quantum dot, maybe. But can the quantum dot be self complementary? Uh, in this case, I, I have a lot of results. Actually, much many results are here. Here, I will show you the best one with a self complementary source. Actually, this is self complementary because if you take into account the magnetic field around the source and the electric field along the source, the division is theta naught. So, this is really self complementary source. But the, the, is the quantum dot a self complementary source? Can you impose magnetic field around the quantum dot and electric field around the quantum dot to satisfy uh, the free space impedance? So, yeah, okay. but you don't really know what the input impedance of the source It's very hard to measure. And it's the same thing with interference bolometers. So, they even think that this is a time domain issue, to, and uh, it's usually difficult to explain that in the frequency domain. General. Yes. Like we always try to do. And so impedance, what is about impedance matching for a single photon detection? <laughs> if, then, uh, actually, uh, it's interesting. We were trying with uh, a different type of source in, in CSD, which is a, a local port from point to point instead of edge to edge, just from point to point. Mm -hmm. And then we realized that the impedance, the input impedance was constant in a big range of frequencies, but it was deviating more and more as the frequency was bigger and bigger. 
because uh, for very little frequency, the wavelength is very small. When the wavelength is of the size similar of the source, then the Mushiakas relationship starts to fail. Actually, you have two limitations for the, for the validity of the Mushiaki formula. One is coming from the finest size. Even, even this is true for this, for perfect electric conductor. Since the, the size is finite, for very uh, small frequencies, the wavelength is for the small frequencies, the wavelength is very big. Then it could be comparable to the wavelength. So for very small frequencies, the Mushiakis uh, relationship starts to fail. But also for very big frequencies, because the wavelength can be of the order of the size of the source at the center. So you have some limitations. Uh, the Nishiaki formula will be more or less valid in some uh, range of frequency. For very low frequency, the problem is the finite size of the antenna. For very high frequency, the problem is the finite size of the source. So this is not an, uh, an important problem. Uh, and uh, even more, when you cannot make uh, something similar to a self compared antenna source in the landscape. <laughs> so, just to, to summarize, make some summary of my answer. Uh, what's the, 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 the your question was the motivation? The, the yes, three different fundamental motivations. Uh, I want to understand why self complementary antennas in plasmonics uh, give uh, broadband behavior better than others, but also. When, when it is uh, not made of good conductors. At the same time, I want to design the program antennas. But also, I'm very motivated by this problem that uh, can you really make a self complementary source? Maybe this will not be a problem for a receiving antenna. In the case of the receiving antenna, for instance, for the application of the volumeter, you don't have that problem. But for the volumeter, you have a different problem. And you need to use two different methods. <laughs> because it is based on the silver effect. And here I am using only silver. Silver and silicon. And what if I use silver, gold, and silicon? We want to do that also. Because gold and silver have similar, very similar plasma frequency. So they, they could be considered almost the same, gold and silver. So in the there are different kinds of volumeters, I think. Yes, but the infrared, in the mid infrared, I know. Like 150 delta. But what? For this uh, frequency yeah. range and for this type of materials, I don't know. Uh, do, are there any real practical uh, problems right now that it is you, you need a broadband nano antenna for this frequency range? I mean, like from coming from industry, what, what, whatever. Or this is just let's say our guess that it would be nice if you have a broadband antenna, an antenna for this frequency energy range. Harvest. And if you want to make energy harvesting. Solar energy harvest uh, in, the, in the whole uh, uh, frequency range of the infrared. So you will, uh, okay, uh, you, you say something like this, okay, you have solar cells, solar cells have some efficiency, let's say, I don't know, X, X percentage uh, in this frequency range. Okay, you will make solar cell based on the principle of this kind of nano antennas, you increase this efficiency on as if you have to make some kind of rectification of the signal. Yep. Yeah, it is not uh, easy. That's why I told our motivation is mainly fundamental. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see, I see. No, fundamental is, is fine, it's fine now. But uh, yeah, uh, in, in general, it is, it is very difficult to make something with kind of pen. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> so, so, so one, one uh, small uh, question about the broadband behavior. Uh, 
Okay, great. Uh, anybody else? Uh, maybe in June? I think we have too many questions still, so we better discuss it later on. I thought the same because uh, it was a great seminar with the many, many ideas uh, coming to our minds. And uh, probably we have a lot to discuss after the seminar. Uh, so today, I think uh, that's all for today. And uh, I hope uh, some of you will stay here to discuss with the fund. I think uh, the discussion will be continue yes. in the coming part, something like this at 6 30 today. Yes. Well. Yeah, guys, so uh, <laughs> we, we start from the coffee machine in half an hour exactly, and we go to some bar on my office kids. Uh, so if you want to join us, uh, maybe you and understand something uh, from fundamental economics <laughs> after a few cups of beer. So you are welcome to, to, to join. Thank you. Thanks to all participants. See you next week. Thank you. Ah, I'm going to